I met Charles Mingus in 1964. He was performing at the Five Spot in New York City. Jazz was in its heyday. It was a time when musicians could play, Thelonious Monk and Charles Mingus both could play at the Five Spot for six months at a time. This is pretty remarkable. Today, musicians are lucky if they get a week in a club, so you can imagine what it was like in those days. Uh, Thelonious Monk had just been on the cover of Time magazine, and everything was at its apex. And then the Beatles came in, and that changed everything for jazz. Um, but C Charles continued performing, like all the jazz musicians, through the next decade. He died in 1979 of Lou Gehrig's disease, and since then we've been carrying on the music with a number of Mingus repertory bands, one of which the Mingus Orchestra will be performing at Tanglewood. So of these three bands, the one, as we say, with the funny instruments, which means the instruments that aren't common for jazz. We have a bassoon, a French horn, a bass clarinet in the Mingus Orchestra. And uh, we also will have a harp uh, when we perform at Tanglewood. And as you see behind me, my mother used to play the harp many, many years ago, and I have a special fondness for it. We have a wonderful harpist, Edgar Edmar Castaneda, who will be a special guest artist. And Gunther Schuller will not only conduct, but uh, we will perform either three or four arrangements of his especially arranged for the, at one especially arranged for this concert at um, Tanglewood, a piece called Inquisition, which is from a long epic piece that Charles wrote called Epitaph. The Mingus Big Band is a pretty traditional big jazz band. There's three trumpets. Big jazz bands normally have three or four trumpets, three or four trombones. And then we have five reeds. We have two uh, alto saxophones, two tenor saxophones, and a baritone, mm -hmm. and then a rhythm section, bass, piano, and drums. The Mingus dynasty is half that, a rhythm section with four horns. Well, the orchestra plays more orchestral works. Uh, the orchestra breathes a little bit more than the big band. There are more spaces. There, the big band is the cowboy band. It plays. With heft, it's the best known. Uh, it's a roaring engine. Um, we started, when did we start? I think the first band that I started after Charles died was called the Mingus Dynasty. Mm -hmm. This is the small one, it's seven pieces. There was a tribute to Mingus at Carnegie Hall where a number of bands played, and they asked me to put a band together to play Mingus music. Now, this was something I had never done. I had no idea what to do. I looked at the record jackets, and I plucked out um, a band that Charles used in, on the seminal records on Columbia uh, in 1959, and it was Four Horns in a Rhythm Section. So I called up the musicians, and uh, as it turned out, we were the only band of all the people that performed at this Mingus tribute that actually played Mingus music. So that was a wake-up call. We realized that people were not playing Mingus music, like they played Duke Ellington's music or, or a composition of other jazz musicians. So that was a reason to keep this band going, and that, that's the reason why we have all these Mingus repertory bands, because when Charles died, he was such a powerful figure, and he owned the music, and I think people didn't want to trespass the territory. It was his music, and other musicians were not playing it. So that's the reason. Gunther Schuller was one of the original appreciators of Charles Mingus as a composer, way back when. Um, he asked Charles to participate at um, a festival that he was in charge of. Um, he conducted an extended work of Charles's called Half Mass Inhibition. Charles wrote marvelous titles, uh, <laughs> evocative titles. Um, and he worked together with Charles on a number of projects when, when Charles was alive. So he was at when we discovered this enormous masterwork of Mingus's, it was over 500 pages, 
It weighed 15 pounds on my bathroom scale. It was written for 31 musicians and needed a conductor, so I called up Gunther, and he helped assemble this and put this in shape, and we premiered it. It was suitably called Epitaph. Charles said he wrote it for his tombstone. He knew he would never get it performed in his lifetime. So this was performed uh, 10 years after Charles died in 1989. It was premiered here in New York at Lincoln Center with Gunther Schuller conducting. We'll be performing a piece called Taurus in the Arena of Life, which was uh, arranged by Gunther last year. Another piece called Noon Night, uh, which was part of Epitaph. Uh, beautiful, lush ballad. Um, as I say, this new piece that, that Gunther still has to arrange, which is um, part of Epitaph called Inquisition. And there's one more. Oh, half ma th this piece I mentioned. Ha we have an arrangement for the Mingus Orchestra called Half Mass Inhibition. We have one of our biggest projects is the Mingus High School competition, which we started three years ago. And it's a national competition, and kids come from all over the country and compete. We hold it at the Manhattan School of Music here. It's now a three-day event. We have a whole day of clinics and workshops, brass clinics, rhythm section clinics, reed clinics. I wanted to write about the year that Charles died in Mexico. It was an extraordinary experience. Mingus was a very physical presence. He was known originally as Jazz's angry man. And he died with such grace. And um, he was completely in charge of all of us. He was frozen in a wheelchair, eventually couldn't move. And he never lost his appetites for everything. We used to drive all night long through Mexico. He had insomnia when he was well and when he was sick. He wrote a piece called The Man Who Never Sleeps. And he didn't sleep, I don't think, ever <laughs> in the year we were in Mexico. And we used to drive, he was in a wheelchair in a special van. And it was kind of like rocking in a cradle when we drove. So we would drive through the night and we would eat all through the night. Every 20 or 30 minutes we would stop at a roadside stand or a, uh, there are a lot of squares in Mexico that are open all night long. And uh, it was a care of, it was a holiday in a way, this, these months of Charles dying, which was so extraordinary that this vitality and, and love for life was never diminished. Uh, even f contained in this wheelchair. So I wanted to write about that, and I was going to call it Portrait of the Artist as a Dying Man. And then the publisher said, well, who are you? Who's the voice? You know, what's your background? So it developed into something I hadn't, more personal than I had intended, and it became a, a general memoir of my life, and de my life with Charles, and his living and dying with Charles. It's called Tonight at Noon. And we have a piece called, uh, and I stole the title from Charles. Um, somebody told me that Lionel Hampton, I'm trying to think. Uh, so there's a piece, a, a title that Charles came up with that Lionel Hampton used himself. So Charles had to find another title. It was had Sun in it, Midnight Sun. Is that a Lionel Hampton tune? I think so. So since Charles couldn't use it, he came up with the title Tonight at Noon. And then he expanded on that, and he wrote another tune called New Night, which I mentioned before, which is an epitaph. Mm -hmm. The contents of epitaph span Mingus's life. Uh, he wrote two extraordinary pieces when he was 17 years old. One was called The Chill of Death, which we will be performing in Tanglewood with the Mingus Orchestra. And another was half mast inhibition. They're very complex pieces, and he wrote them when he was 17 years old. And um, The Chill of Death is included in Epitaph. And it's sort of all through Charles's life, music that he wrote. Um, it, it's, it's as if he was reviewing his own life up to the very end, right. musically. And he tried to get this performed <clears throat> in the 60s, and it was a disaster for many reasons. The record company moved the date up, they didn't have the, music wasn't ready in time. 
Um, there are a lot of stories about it. I, I think shreds of this concert were put out <clears throat> with the title Town Hall. But it was never, uh, and as Gunther Schuller said, nobody had any idea that there was this massive work called Epitaph that Charles was attempting to perform then. And I think it had a major impact on him. I think he thought he was going to show the world who he was in 1961. And, uh, and it was a great personal, um, if not a tragedy, it certainly was a, a setback for Charles. Mm -hmm.